Fresh and free, Canada's west coast is one of those rare places that can still be called truly wild. This is a land of giants with deep canyons and towering forests, endless lakes and vast spaces, extreme nature and huge wildernesses. Even the wildlife is massive and the adventures are awesome. A fabulous place for an ultimate journey. Tucked between the Strait of Georgia and the Coast Mountains, Vancouver is in the state of British Columbia. The American border is just 38 kilometers south of here. It takes less than three hours to drive to Seattle in Washington. Downtown Vancouver is an eclectic mix of glass and concrete. With two million inhabitants, it's the biggest city in Western Canada and the third biggest in the whole of the country. Vancouver's authorities have deliberately encouraged the development of high rises as a way of curbing urban sprawl. As a result, much of Vancouver can be explored either on foot or by public transport. This means fewer traffic jams, good news for those who live here as well as for those visiting. Vancouver has therefore developed a unique atmosphere. It has a big city buzz with the small town charm. Private houses nestle comfortably between the high-rise buildings and peaceful breathing spaces are never far away. Founded as recently as 1861, Vancouver used to be called Gastown. One of the most famous landmarks in the historic quarter is the world's first steam clock. Although it's styled to look like a 19th century antique, it was only built in 1977. This piece of unusual technology still manages to attract hundreds of tourists every day as they wait for the chimes to ring every 15 minutes. As a multicultural city, Vancouver prides itself on being a city of neighborhoods, each with a distinct character and ethnic mix. Between Carroll Street and Gore Avenue lies Chinatown. This is the third biggest Chinese settlement along the entire west coast of America, packed with small shops, markets, and restaurants. Here, you'll find just about anything under the sun, not to mention the things you probably never knew even existed, and many you probably can't even identify. It's a gastronome's dream. Seafood doesn't come much fresher than this. It doesn't take long to be served because much of the food is quickly deep fried. Eating here means putting a healthy diet on hold for a while. It's worth it though for an unforgettable gourmet meal. As well as traditional Peking duck and sweet and sour pork, you can also try hundreds of other tasty dishes, many available 24-7. To add to the atmosphere, the chefs sometimes throw in a little extra ingredient, a live show of their own. Thank you. Elsewhere, the menu couldn't be more different. Yale Town is Vancouver's most fashionable suburb. It's the place to see and be seen. Menus here are less exotic, serving typically North American cuisine. And a lot of restaurants have microbreweries on site, making them very popular during the summer months. Once you've had your fill, it's time to head out of the city. The Lionsgate Bridge takes you out across Burrard Inlet towards Squamish. First-time visitor Ashley Brewer 
has a very persuasive streak in her. She found a way to get adventure without compromising on comfort by convincing her boyfriend, Tom Rothwell, to hire a camper van. After an easy drive of just two hours, they arrive at Whistler Village, where the 2010 Winter Olympics will be held. But you don't have to be an athlete to take part in sport here. Ashley has been working her charm again. She's figured out how to bungee jump without actually having to do anything. She's persuaded Tom to do a tandem jump. I'm freaking out. I'm happy that I get to jump with Tom and I get to hold on to him really tight and he is the one who has to jump off the edge. So that makes me happy because you probably have to push me. <laughs> He's the lead dog. Yeah, Whistler Bungee's been here about five years. It's one of the best bungee jumping sites in the world. It's a 52 meter high bridge over a glacier fed river. It's beautiful here in Whistler. It's definitely one of the best sites in the world. scarier because you got to worry about banging heads or someone screaming loud in your eardrum. Just, it, there's a lot more connections here. It's much more convoluted and complicated. It's easier to make a mistake, so it just raises the ante. She could knee him in the private area there. That's never good. Uh, but overall, it's, it's, it's a wonderful way to go as well. If you're going to go, you might as well go with a loved one. How romantic. <laughs> For love, Tom will clearly bend over backwards. Rewarded with a massive adrenaline rush, the couple are hoisted back up by a quad bike. Ashley got the thrill she wanted. Yeah! That was awesome! I'm such a chicken, but it was awesome and nothing. It's so easy. She won't settle for one adrenaline rush, though, so they start to search for another adventure. While Tom gets to work, other holidaymakers get ready for a wilderness adventure. A private float plane waits to take friends Laurie Werschler and Stephanie Herbert to a wild island. From the harbor, it's a short flight across the Pacific to one of Canada's highlights. Vancouver Island, a wildlife wilderness. From the air, Laurie and Stephanie get a great view of the rugged coastline and the rainforests. Decades of deforestation have left only 4% of Canada's original rainforest and Vancouver Island is the best place to see it. This is the biggest island of the American West Coast, about 454 kilometers long and 100 kilometers wide. After about half an hour in the air, the plane touches down just offshore. An exciting start to this wild adventure. First stop, McQuinna Provincial Marine Park, with one of the few remaining rainforests in British Columbia on the west coast of Vancouver Island. The big attraction in McQuinna are the hot springs at Hot Springs Cove. You can take a leisurely stroll through the forest on a raised boardwalk before you get there. Whatever the reason, the dominating color in the park is green. These trees form part of what is called old growth forest. This means that the trees are all between 180 and 220 years old. And they can grow incredibly tall as well, up to 90 meters sometimes. 
The trees are stressed by strong winds, heavy rainfall and low nutrient soil, and so develop their twisted, knotty branches, which give them this aged, wizened look. A good place to uh, to make a home. To yeah, mm -hmm. to make a home. I can move in there. I can <laughs> set up a pretty good living room. It's bigger than my apartment. <laughs> the whole forest has a storybook feel to it. The spray from the ocean and the steam rising off the hot springs dotted around the park create an eerie, mystical feeling. Now they follow the two kilometers of boardwalk through the park to the hot springs. From the deep, the boiling spring bubbles and cascades down a cliff into a series of rock pools, cooled by the incoming Pacific Ocean. This daily tidal action also flushes the pools, so they're always crystal clear and clean. With a fantastic view of the Pacific Ocean, the girls enjoy a relaxing soak in a hot pool. Oh, yeah, I'm sure, and then they're probably just dying. It's quite amazing to walk through a forest and then come out at the end of it and find this hot spring, this natural hot spring that's absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. You could spend all day sitting here. The water is a rather warm 47 degrees Celsius, but for those who enjoy a hot bath, it's a fantastic way to make your cares and worries evaporate. For magic of a different kind, there's always Victoria, the capital of British Columbia. Tourists flock to the harbor area and its many attractions. Street artists and buskers provide all sorts of entertainment, some better than others. This is the best place to relax and catch up on your people watching. There's plenty of sightseeing to do as well. From the marina, you can see downtown Victoria, the Parliament Building, and the Empress Hotel. This is the place to head for if you need a more refined experience. The minute you step in through the doors of this hotel, you step back in time, back to the 19th century. Here, old-fashioned splendor and hospitality combine with modern comfort and luxury. This hotel has it all. To see accommodation of a very different kind, you need to go back to the waterfront and catch a ferry. Some of Victoria's inhabitants don't live on land, but on water, and the ferryman knows exactly how to amaze his passengers. He takes them on a short trip out of the harbor to see floating houses that look nothing like the basic houseboats or canal boats that first spring to mind. The houseboats he has in mind are these ultra luxurious homes. They have their own sewer system and water and gas supplies. They have high speed internet access and some even have built-in fireplaces, basements, and wine cellars. Although the float houses are incredibly stable, they are susceptible to tidal movement, which can sometimes be up to three meters, so residents need a good set of sea legs. Houseboats have been a form of low-cost living since the 1880s, often in illegal and unsafe condition. But these residents have taken waterborne living to a new level. And now these homes not only comply to every governing safety regulation, but the lifestyle has become sought after. 
one of these houseboats could set you back upwards of $200,000. The ferryman's patter offers a great insight into a different way of life. He provides a whole different perspective on Victoria itself. He delivers his passengers safely back to solid ground just before the sun sets over the harbour. The working day is over, but the nightlife is beginning to buzz. Hungry from the sea air, visitors head straight for one of the many restaurants dotted around Victoria. Victoria's local chefs are blessed with an abundance of local produce and seafood, especially shellfish and salmon. There may be a bit of a wait to get into one of the many restaurants, but it's well worth it. If it's solitude you're after though, just head 180 kilometers north of Victoria to a wilderness called Night Inlet. It is so remote that the only way to get here is by boat or float plane. And the only reason to come here is to see some of the most awesome and dangerous animals in the world. Bears. Both black bears and the more dangerous grizzly bears live on this island. Black bears eat mostly berries, grasses and roots. But insects, small mammals, birds and lizards comprise about a quarter of their diet. Black bears have a lifespan of about 30 years, though in the wild, few make it past 10. Apart from grizzlies, humans pose the greatest threat to the black bears. More than 90% of black bear deaths can be traced back to some kind of human encounter. At Night Inlet, it's the grizzlies who are the forest kings. Two scientists study grizzly bear behavior at Night Inlet. Dr. Owen Nevin is a behavioral and population ecologist. His colleague, Dr. Barry Gilbert, has been studying bears for more than three decades and once paid a heavy price for his passion. Almost 30 years ago, he stumbled over a sleeping grizzly. The startled animal immediately attacked, leaving one half of Dr. Gilbert's face permanently scarred. He was lucky to escape with his life. This horrific experience didn't lessen his enthusiasm for wanting to save these creatures from extinction. Every day, the two scientists travel to Night Inlet from their base station. At shore, they leave behind their boat and the safety of their own environment and cross into the world of dangerous grizzly bears. For protection, they depend on their combined knowledge and experience. Few people know as much about grizzly bears as these two scientists, and they stay alert at all times, looking and listening for signs of grizzlies. Above all, they never lose their respect for the grizzlies, as they monitor their movements at Night Inlet. The bears at Night Inlet have recently woken from their five-month winter sleep. Dr. Gilbert spots two young grizzlies engrossed in a water fight. Like many young animals, these two bears spend much of their time play fighting like this. It's a way of measuring each other's strength, and it's good practice for later when these play fights will escalate into full-blown battles, which could be fatal for the loser. Watching these two young bears in action it's hard to believe that Dr. Gilbert survived being attacked for real by an adult. Leaving the youngsters to their play, the two men wind their way through the forest. They pause at a tree covered in interesting markings. 
To the trained eye, these signs tell a story rich in detail. So we've got a uh, big area of the tree that's rubbed free of moss and uh, some bite marks. There's a nice fresh bite mark there where the bear's been biting into the tree. And you see up here, we've got some fur uh, that's um, stuck on the tree where they've been rubbing. Nice fresh uh, sign of bear. That was barely held on, so a breeze would have blown that away. Yeah, this is a nice example where the bear turns its head and with the canines takes a big bite. You can see the sap coming out and then they turn around and rub against all that sap and both the tooth marks and the rubbing tell other bears that this particular bear has been there. So it's a nice traditional signpost. But he's bigger than you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Fresh sign and maybe it's a place we should put a camera. Yeah, I think it's got a uh, camera. Got a lot of fresh bites and uh, we might get some good uh, Good activity on this tree. Lots of nice trees to put a camera on as well. Okay, there's a camera. If you hold that for the a scientists carefully position their camera, putting it in the best place to catch any bear activity. And it's uh, pretty much centered. We've got it right uh, aiming at the direction we want. It's, uh... So inside this camouflage box here, we have a, a small uh, compact digital camera, uh, which is hooked up uh, to a battery supply and an infrared sensor. We've got the infrared sensor on the bottom works just like your burglar alarm at home, detects changes in uh, temperature. So when something warm moves, like a bear moving through the frame, uh, it triggers the camera, takes a shot. If the leaves of the trees, which aren't warm, move around, we don't get pictures. It can take days to capture something on film, especially since grizzlies are largely nocturnal. The scientists have done their bit. Now it's over to the bears and to Lady Luck. While the scientists sit back and wait, Laurie and Stephanie decide that it's time for some action. Revived from their hot spa, they sign up for something more challenging. They head towards the Horn Lake Caves, no longer alone, but accompanied by a specialist guide, John Harvey, who leads them to the Beaufort Range, which consists of seven cave systems. The scientific study of caves is called speleology, the recreational pastime is called spelunking. Yeah. Laurie and Stephanie nervously prepare okay, to go ladies, deep we're underground. Going the cave. We need to have our helmets on. You're going to need that light. It's going to be your best friend. Make sure your chin strap got up and you have a good fit. John leads the two girls from the fairy tale forest deep into a strange and spooky underworld. Not a glimmer of light penetrates through the thick rock. Headlamps provide the only source of light as Laurie and Stephanie concentrate hard on keeping their footing as they squeeze through steep, narrow tunnels. These open up into a big cave system where John draws their attention to the unusual scenery. So that helictite that I was pointing out is right in there. Laurie and Stephanie get used to crouching as they walk, so they don't bump their heads. John knows exactly where to take them. The highlight of the trip is a cave called River Bend, dripping with crystals. River Bend is one of my favorite caves. It's, this is a spectacular place, mostly because it's not only a really interesting terrain, but it has these crystals, these amazing crystals that you'll see all the way through. For me, that's the best part of the cave. I come to see the challenge of the climbing, but also to be able to see the crystals and how they've been growing. It tells me a story about the ancient history in the cave. While the girls explore deep below ground, our adventure seekers Ashley and Tom are heading high up to the Whistler Blackcomb mountain range. Ashley is busy mapping out how to get her next adrenaline kick without actually doing any of the work herself. This time, she signed up for a chauffeur-driven, Hollywood-style drive in a Hummer. Given the number of celebrities who own Hummers, you would be forgiven for thinking that these vehicles were designed for driving up and down Hollywood Boulevard. 
But Tom and Ashley quickly discover what the Hummer can really do. Their guide pushes the indestructible Hummer to the extreme as it climbs, crawls, and bumps over every obstacle. This is awesome. It's really steep. <laughs> The guide does his best to satisfy Ashley's insatiable appetite for passive adventure. Has he succeeded? It was bouncy, we went sideways over big rocks, it's beautiful scenery, yeah. the weather's nice. You know, it's something we've never had a chance to do before. So, no, I've you know, never we ridden really... in a Hummer, so... Exactly, so that we had a really awesome. good time. Adventure enough, then, even for Ashley. The pace feels much steadier back on Vancouver Island in the small town of Utluit. Even the name sounds peaceful. Utluit means safe harbor. With just 1,700 inhabitants, it's the perfect place to slow right down and experience the gentle pace of life. Perhaps this serenity comes from their proximity to fantastic marine wildlife. In summer, the sea here teems with dolphins and whales. Pacific white-sided dolphins, or lags, ride the bow waves of the marine tour boats as they head into Johnston Strait. Visitors watch, entranced, as the acrobatic dolphins keep pace with the boat, sometimes leaping several body lengths above the water, apparently just for the fun of it. The dolphins put on a hypnotizing warm-up act to the main performance, which the tourists hope will take place further out at sea. But the skipper can't guarantee that they will see anything else. The passengers keep their cameras ready and their fingers crossed. The creatures they so desperately want to see are orcas, or killer whales. But the killer whales truly are ambassadors for everything else. They are literally telling the story of our oceans, how much we As have they changed. head towards the open sea, marine biologist Jackie McFadden briefs them about what to expect. She knows these orcas so well that she even has a family tree and can identify individuals by the shape and color of their dorsal fins. What is remarkable about this area, Johnstone Strait, is that we have this concentration of fish-eating killer whales. They don't live here, they are named residents, but they come through the Johnstone Strait area because of the large concentration of fish. It's also an important area because they can hear one another in these open channels for over 20 kilometers. And suddenly, there they are, the orcas. They arrive here in summer to feast on migrating salmon. Orcas are highly social animals. They live in matriarchal pods, and the offspring, including the males, stay with the family all their lives. Each pod has its own distinct dialect, made up of about a dozen calls. The Johnston Strait has one of the highest concentrations of orcas in the world. What's amazing about today is the sheer number of whales we had the privilege to see. Uh, highly social animals interacting between family groups, remarkable families that always stay together and a mate across the families, never leaving their mothers. Relationships and strong family bonds are as important to orcas as they are to humans. The visitors can't believe their luck. The animals seem so relaxed and choose to cruise alongside the boat for some time. The extraordinary show even includes choreographed dives. Their dorsal fins, which can reach 1.8 meters in height, slice gracefully through the water. And then the orcas vanish into the spume. Elsewhere on Vancouver Island, the fog thickens. 
Stephanie and Laurie have been in fairy tale forests and spooky grottos, and now they're entering a seascape of mist and mystery. They too are on a quest for marine creatures. Shapes rise blurred and ambiguous through the dense fog. The eerie atmosphere leaves the visitors breathless and speechless. Hiding behind a camera doesn't make it any less creepy. As they peer through the mist, some of the mottled boulders twitch into life. Harbor seals resting on the rocky outcrops. They manage to snap a few pictures. They don't hang around for long. They don't want to disturb the seals after all. Plus, this fog is getting just a little bit too atmospheric. A cheerful sparkle of sun lightens the mood back at Night Inlet. This is grizzly territory, and somewhere among those trees are the bears themselves. Scientists Dr. Owen Nevin and Dr. Barry Gilbert can't wait to find out where, but they'll need some specialist equipment. OK, I'm just putting together our VHF antenna, uh, the bears with the collars on, as well as getting their satellite signal, uh, give us a radio signal. Uh, so we should be able to find out if there's any around here in this area using this. OK, we'll see what we get. OK, so maybe just turn it on. Okay. You, you hear the pulse, it uh, goes tick tick. Um, that's a signal coming from uh, one of our bears that we have collared. Um, and we can use the antenna uh, to determine the direction that that comes from uh, to find the bear. So if you turn the antenna, it gets stronger and weaker. So it seems not too far not away. Not too now. far off, no. Yeah. Probably down this way. Yeah, channel. probably down this way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. nice and yeah. strong. Nice yeah. and strong down that way. The two scientists set off in the direction that the signal was coming from, hoping that the bear doesn't move away too quickly. They keep checking their signal to make sure they don't veer off course. OK, so this is a very short range um, VHF signal. We need to be quite close to the bears to pick it up. Uh, it's a small antenna. With the collars, we also have a satellite um, receiver on them. So just like a GPS in your car, um, it picks up the location uh, and stores the locations on the bear's collar. And then when they have enough locations, they send uh, via satellite phone. So uh, they send an email to my uh, computer via satellite phone uh, with all the locations that, that are stored on, on the collar. So uh, every 30 minutes, the collar stores a location. And then once a day, that gets sent uh, by email to me. The bear they've been tracking doesn't look as though he'll be going anywhere for a while. He has joined several other grizzlies as they wait patiently for the banquet of the year. Salmon. Each year, millions of salmon swim upstream to spawn, overcoming staggering challenges on the way. So concentrated are the fish in the shallows that the bears simply help themselves snapping up fish in their jaws and then clutching them between their paws. Experienced bears use the bank or stones for purchase. Novices don't find it quite so easy. Despite the abundance of fish, a cub can't quite get the hang of it. It turns to its mother for scraps. With such an abundance of fish, there's no chance of anyone going hungry. The youngster will need to master the art of salmon catching himself someday but for now, they share the spoils. The annual salmon run offers the bear equivalent of an all-you-can-eat buffet. The bears pick the salmon off at an incredible rate, 
each time improving their technique of grab, grip, and gobble. Yeah, he's got a fish. He'll uh, find somewhere to lean it there, and uh, he's going to take the skin off, maybe, if it take out the eggs from a uh, female fish. It looks like a female fish that he's got. You can see here he's just pulling out the eggs, that nice pink bit there. At the start of the spawning season, hungry bears will polish off the whole salmon. Later, when they've put on weight, they get fussy, picking out the tastiest bits and discarding the rest. The salmon run helps the bears build up a fat reserve, which will keep them alive during the cold winter hibernation. Bears will gain up to one pound in weight a day. Privileged to get so close, the scientists never tire of watching wild grizzlies doing what comes naturally. This youngster is spoiled for choice. Fresh salmon, or perhaps mother's milk. Their high protein diet probably accounts for why grizzlies of the northern areas grow much larger than their Midwest counterparts, who don't have the benefit of the yearly feast of spawning salmon. Doctors Nevin and Gilbert yeah, don't miss there. a thing. They can interpret every bit of behavior they see, for no one knows this population of grizzlies as well as they do. Their work provides precious insights into the bear's habits and their habitats, their lives and loves, and the risks they face, all of which will help protect the species in the future. Thanks to scientists like these two, this cub's future will be that little bit safer. Back on Vancouver Island, Laurie and Stephanie find another adventure in the shape of Surf Sister in Tofino. your full name, height, weight, and shoe size, and then on the back there's a waiver that I'll get you. Uh, today we're going to be surfing at Chesterman's Beach. Uh, we're going to start off by doing about a 20-minute theory on land, uh, and then we're going to head into the water and surf for about an hour. So hopefully by the end of the day, girls will be riding waves. Great. Sounds perfect. Yeah. Can't wait. Kate kits them out with a few necessary accessories. Wetsuits, long boards, and an appropriately psychedelic VW Beetle. Sweet rides, boards, and hopefully some good waves. Kate drives them to Chesterman's Beach, a three-kilometer stretch of sandy white coastline. The pink car never fails to turn heads, but the girls are too busy wondering what they've let themselves in for now. And if the lesson doesn't go well, there's plenty to look at because Kate has told them that surfers here often spot sea lions, otters, and osprey. The girls will start off on long boards. They're about three meters in length, and much easier to balance on than the ones used by the professionals. It's also easier to surf with a long board when there isn't great wave action. The lesson starts with them doing a few dry runs on the sand, Kate puts them through their paces, showing them how to paddle out and then do a quick jump into the standing position. They haven't even got into the water yet, and the girls already realize surfing isn't as easy as it looks. After about half an hour, they head for the water. Both the girls battle to get into the standing position and stay up. Finally, Stephanie manages to catch a wave and ride for a few seconds. Kate shows the girls how it's really done and makes surfing look deceptively easy. Everyone has a good day on the beach and the girls both agree that they'll be back to try again. I 
loved it. There's a long way to go before I get to Hawaii, but I'll definitely come back. I think the day went pretty good. Uh, the waves were a little bit small, but it was still enough that the girls were able to get up. Uh, with these waves like this, it's hard on your arms because you have to paddle extra hard. Uh, but they did well, they had a lot of fun, and they stood up. And uh, they both said they'll try it again, so I think it was definitely a success. They need to do just one more thing to polish off this fantasy. Walk off into the sunset. The day isn't over yet for doctors Nevin and Gilbert at Night Inlet. They want to spend some more time watching the grizzlies fishing, but from a different spot. The viewing platform is bear-proof, so that they know they're completely safe. No bear will sneak up on them here, though it's highly unlikely any bears will wander off from the salmon feast. No, but if they'd been wet, you would have, they would... Uh... What about down in here by the fish? What's he got? Almost on cue, a female leads her three cubs to the salmon pool. She remembers where to find the fish, and her cubs need a bit of practice. But a huge male has already staked his claim to this section. The female faces a dilemma. An angry male could easily kill a cub. But she can't resist the temptation of juicy salmon. So to the scientist's surprise, she tests the water, literally, watching to see how the strange male will react to her boldness. Well trained, the cubs wait for her signal. The big male watches her, the cubs watch her, and the scientists watch them all closely with some trepidation. For this is very unusual behavior, but salmon seem to be the only thing on the big male's mind. Her daring seems to pay off. The male ignores their presence, and so the female allows her cubs to join her. There's a lot to take in, from the cold, wet feeling of the water and trying to swim to splashes of jumping fish and trying to keep up with mum. They've never seen anything like it. The water is almost solid with salmon as far as the eye can see. The female knows from experience that she must bide her time. She dips her head underwater and opens her eyes, watching until she's ready to make her move. Bears have a second transparent eyelid, which helps them to see underwater. With so many fish around, this kind of hunting is less about the chase, more about the matter of sitting and waiting patiently until one swims a little too close. Effortlessly, she grabs her first fish. Two of the cubs aren't having much luck, so they head back to their mother to plead for a morsel. And who could resist the request? The third cub tries for a bit longer, but without much luck either. It won't take long, though, before he becomes a pro, just like his mother, especially if he keeps practicing like this. Instead of honing their own skills, the other two cubs squabble over access to their mother's catch leaving her all the time in the world to finish her meal in peace. Despite years of experience in the field, this kind of family soap opera doesn't play out that often. The two researchers watch with delight. No one notices the big male's change in behavior, though. Another grizzly has challenged his right to fish here. A territorial fight erupts with the family caught in the middle. The challenger chases the first male out of the water, and in the panic and confusion, 
the female and cubs rush away too. No sooner have they left than the cleanup crew get cracking on the leftovers. Fresh salmon, it seems, is popular with everyone, people included. In Canada, we have the best wild salmon in the world. Night Inlet Lodge is famous for its tasty salmon dishes. From here, many tours visit the spawning spots so that visitors can see the bears for themselves. This form of ecotourism protects the grizzlies and other wildlife at Night Inlet. It also helps dispel a few myths about bears. Bear viewing was started, there was a lot of misunderstanding about bears. Uh, people thought they were always aggressive toward people and uh, we needed some research that would lead to good management, good management rules for bear viewing sites and our research has provided a good science that people can base the management on that uh, leads to uh, good nutrition and good ecology for bears and safe people in uh, places like uh, coastal British Columbia. A few days later, the scientists return to the camera to see if there's been any bear activity. Okay, let's see what we got. A quick glance reveals that they've got shots better than they ever hoped for. One of the really exciting things about the current project is it's the first time uh, we've been able to get detailed information on how bears move through the forest and how they use space, how they're um, using the different habitats at different times of the year. It tells us what they're doing when we're not watching them. We can combine that satellite location information with satellite images uh, and uh, see what they are doing and what parts of the forests they are using. Um, so that's uh, one of the big um, projects that we're doing at the moment and uh, it's being uh, supported by uh, the ecotourism business in the area which is a, an exciting step uh, for uh, a private company to fund uh, major scientific investigation. Again, the research has shown how important Night Inlet is for gathering information about bear behaviour and debunking the myths surrounding them. Bears won't attack on a whim. They only do so if provoked or caught off guard. Night Inlet provides a safe environment for bear watching, while tourists and conservationists alike can rest assured that park management is contributing to the survival of the species. And the bears will continue to delight visitors, just like other attractions along the rest of the Canadian West Coast. And most of the time, you'll be an eco-tourist without even knowing it. No matter what kind of adventurer you are, this coast caters to almost any whim. For solitude seekers and fantasy lovers, it offers bewitching seascapes and mysterious hillsides. If you prefer the urban to the wild, Canada's beautiful cities have it all on tap culture and tradition, beaches and sun. You can sit back and take it easy, or choose something more active from the many adventures and big thrills on offer here. And if the huge views don't take your breath away, the massive wildlife certainly will. But whatever you do, Canada's west coast is a great choice for an ultimate journey.